Hi, I'm Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We are live again in three, two, one. All right, guys, welcome back. I, I tell you, the, this is part two with Mr. George Mayfield. We've, we're trying to continue a conversation. Lanny had to leave. We picked up another. We got Daniel Hayes here. Yeah, good to have you. Get some horns. Yeah, yeah, made a fresh cup of coffee, pot of coffee. We're ready. Yeah, this is a – you know, it's you brought these old photographs. You've been turkey hunting a long time. I think I heard you say 1973 was your first turkey. And mm-hmm. and I, I want to say I noticed – You've been wearing moss yoke a long time, oh, and just right out of the since gate. Since the first year. Yeah, since 86. So yeah, you've got a lot of pictures wearing moss yoke. Well, I, you know, it was kind of interesting. Your daddy came over to the to roost one time, and, uh, you know, I had never had anybody ask to see my closet before. <laughs> that still sticks in my mind. But you know what? I wasn't a bit ashamed to show it. I said, and he said, I, I want to see your closet. And, I, it, it, you know, we're a bunch of folks around the fire kind of deal, you know. And I said, well, okay, come on. And I took him back to my room at the roof, and I opened those sliding doors. And he looked in there and shook his head and said, hmm, just right. Because <laughs> there wasn't anything but Mozzie O hanging in there. And that's no kidding now. And uh, Well, I had never you know, seen you wear any other like, I mean, it's I always bottle well, in a green I mean, it's, I look, when you run a commercial hunting lodge, people will bring you their firstborn child and donate it if you'll put them on a big buck. <laughs> okay? mm-hmm. So I have been given enough hunting gear and stuff over the years. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm old-fashioned. I know I am, but uh, brand loyalty and the stuff works and don't fix it if it ain't broke. Yeah, I hear you. Well, that, that was one of my favorite things I heard you say when you were talking about when you started wearing bottom land and you felt like turkey hunting started to get easier. And you said uh, to be invisible, you got to feel invisible. And the confidence of feeling good about what you're wearing and, you know, the feeling of being invisible when you're wearing bottom land makes you act a little more invisible. Well, it, it is a feeling. And I coined a phrase, uh, me and my my buddies, you know, drinking a little beer around the campfire and stuff like that before Mossy Oak was ever invented. And I called it back then, and I showed you some of those pictures. It was about getting green. When you're turkey hunting, you got to get green. And and I meant by that is that you gotta you gotta feel it. You gotta be it. You gotta be part of the landscape. You you can't be outstanding. You need to be unseen and blend in. And uh, and I tried to pass that idea, that concept on by talking about that to people that were, you know, you know, used to kind of sitting on the stump with a cowboy hat and turkey hunting. I mean, that don't work out too good, you know. And and uh, you you got to realize what you can get away with and what you can't. And uh, and when I I started wearing that stuff. I've, I got away with more. And, and listen, I've never professed to, to be the caller guy, you know. Uh, I can call good enough, kill a turkey, but uh, I don't rely on that. I rely on my ability to get where I need to be uh, in a timely fashion, which that's harder to, harder for me to do now, but to get there unseen, relatively unheard, and while I am there, I do not want uh, to be picked off. And uh, now, I'm going to tell you, to be 100% honest, there's some of them turkeys out there, I don't care what you got on, they're going to pick you off if you don't sit right. You got to sit in the shadows. You got to sit back in between the, 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 you know, a big old oak tree that's got, you know, roots coming out. You better hide and wear the right stuff. But uh, a lot of them, you can get away with murder. And uh, just stay out of the sun and don't move, and you're better off, you know. But I, that feeling that goes along with wearing the right clothes 
is paramount. It's not something you need to be worrying about when you're hunting. In other words, you've got to put them on in the morning and go and everything else, all these other things that are going on, that's what you need to be focusing on. And if you got confidence in your clothes, and, and you know, it's, that's it makes it a lot easier. That's right. Yeah, it does. Daniel, have you got a question you wanted to, to, to ask something in your mind? If you don't, I sure got a bunch here. Yeah, no, I would, I would love to sit here for the entire podcast, but since i got to leave town, I'll be – catching the rest uh, in the recorded version like everybody else listening out there. But there's one thing that one of my favorite it just reminded me of it. You brought those, uh, those old prints of the cover of Old Pro Turkey Hunter. One of my favorite pieces of Mississippi turkey hunting history is that Gene Nunnery for a little while taught a, a night class elective in Meridian at the community college about how to turkey hunt. Uh, and I always I thought that was incredible. So you could get college credit. You get for college that. credit as an elective for learning how to turkey hunt <laughs> he, from Gene Nunnery. He was worthy – of that position. Yeah, so I was, you know, maybe we should uh, talk to Mississippi State or EMCC, see if we can reinstitute that program, get a little night class going. Well, I listen, and, and I'll be brief with this, but my mission since my father passed in 2003, that's why I was looking at the pictures with your grandfather and all this, and I understand what all that means to you. I, I my, my daddy was sick. And we knew he was what the the future brought. And uh, I was trying to thank him for all that he had done for me and, you know, him and mom had done for me. And uh, and he was a gentleman, and he he didn't ever interrupt anybody and and all that. And he stopped me in mid-sentence, and he said, Son, you don't owe me anything or your mom. He said, Just pass it on. And that's what I intend to do. So, yes, I'm wide open. You want to do something like that and and, uh, and be part of it, I would be I would be uh, honored. Well, sign us up. I think we could probably yeah. find a few people to go yeah. to turkey school. Uh, he'd be a good professor of turkeys. Yeah, there'd be sure. a waiting list. Let's talk yeah. turkeys. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what I'll... I, I can talk it a lot better than I'm walking now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so look, let's. What I'd like to start with, I'll ask you to bring your calls. And my goodness, you brought a bag over there that uh, I, I assume that's what your, your calls are. It, it, it's yeah, a giant a, bag, one of those that what, what Avery b- bags. But Lyle Gilbert gave me this bag, and. Uh, I guess he felt sorry for me because I had everything I owned in that little metal box right there. That's about a 1950 metal box. Yeah, Lyle, from, Houndstooth yes, calls. They yes. make some great stuff. So what I want to do is uh, I'd like you to just go through some scenarios. You're walking and you sit down to a turkey that you, you've got a pretty well, good feeling he's there. Dude, I, I, I didn't bring in. I don't. My, I, I don't feel comfortable doing any calling, but I will show you my calls, and uh, and you know I can't give all my secrets. <laughs> okay. and, <laughs> yeah. Well, just talk about what calls you you like, like friction well, calls. You, or, so, are, are you going when you sit down? Are you going? To, are you going to tree call to that turkey with a mouth call? Are you going to cluck on a slate? Probably just, not going to tree call to him. You know, uh, I don't tree call that good anyway. Uh, I tell you, old, uh, Walter Parrott used to tree call with the best of the best. Alex Rutledge was good. When I was judging back in the day, Toxie, you know, he had me. I judged 13 world championships. What's the secret to a good tree call? Uh, I, I guess sound like a hen turkey. But I mean, is, is, I, it, is it being so <laughs> quiet? That- I mean, well, I, don't, I don't get that really. Uh, what's that got to do with killing a turkey? Seriously, I mean, why would you tree call to him? What you going? What's he? What's he going to do? Gobble? Well, isn't he gobbling already? How would you? Why would you be sitting there close enough? You know, I mean, tree call to him if he wasn't already gobbling. If he's already gobbling, you know where he's at. So, what you going to talk about? You know, uh, not being ugly now, but well, I'm I- just trying. I'm just trying to think about. Okay, yes, I have tree called to a turkey before, but I don't. I mean. Well, if I if you're scared to call it to turkey, then tree call is probably a good choice because he's probably not. If you're doing it right, he's not going to hear much. It's sort of like judging a tree call in a contest. It's like, yeah, they're all pretty good, <laughs> you know, if they don't get too loud, you know, and if they got that little break in it, and 
and some people throw that rasp in there and that break, and that even sounds better. So you give them a point or two higher. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm just trying to get inside your mind a little well, bit about what, what, I mean, what's you going on. Already. I so, mean, <laughs> so if you're not tree calling, I've learned well, something I mean, already. I just, I, look, it goes back to why I'm call shy anyway. I don't call that well. Well, I don't so believe I that. Do, I've heard you yell. So. Well, you, now there's something I can do. <laughs> so let's let's just walk and, uh, through that, that but, yell. But here, here's the deal. When I'm sitting to a turkey, and I'm in there pretty tight with a turkey, that's generally had never worked out much for me, but it has occasionally. I've killed a few off the limb over the years, you know. But uh, what I want to do, if I get that close, I want to be able to look at him because I want to know which way he's facing on the limb. And or sometimes you can tell by the way he's gobbling, you know. You can audibly tell that he's facing away from you, or gobbling at you in your direction. And there's a time, there's a critical point in time right there when he'd be tipping on the limb. He's getting ready to fly down. He's looking around more and more active. You know, he's gobbling. He's kind of gotten more sporadic, and he's getting ready to fly down. And uh, if he's gobbling away from you at that point in time, then you might want to do a little yelp. But I'm not in a tree. I don't think I've ever sat to a turkey in the top of a tree. <laughs> and uh, not that I wouldn't, but, I mean, you know, uh, so me tree crawling off the ground at 60 yards over there, you know, just don't make a lot of sense to me. So uh, so I generally wait till I can say something relevant to him. And uh, I would rather, if I'm watching him, and uh, he's getting ready to fly down the other way, then I'll throw my head back around and I might yelp back behind me and see if I can turn him on the limb. Because if he flies the other way, I mean, that's not the end of the world, but if I'm sitting pretty tight and he flies my way, I can kill him. And early in the season when the hens are all right there, the objective is to get in there before they do. And that's why you would even try to get tight in there, but you run the risk of running all the other gobblers off in the hens. And I, I learned, especially dragging a sport around, it's better not to try that, you know. <laughs> you know, it's better just stay on back and let it all go down and then try your shot that way. I, th I think you just want to stay in the woods longer. That's why you, well, don't, you, know, that's why you don't kill them so early. Oh, uh, Lord. <laughs> Do you know what now? I never kept data on it. Wish I had, but I guarantee you. In a season, and you know, in my travels and all my guiding and all that, you know, there might be two that that come off the limb, you know. But it's a, it's a rare event, you know. I mean, it's not something that happens very often, and there's a reason for it. I mean, the, the turkeys, that's not when you kill them. Have you ever noticed when you're sitting in the woods and, and like up in the Ozarks and all, you're up there hunting and and when you hear the gunfire, you might hear one full daylight. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's them boys from Arkansas. <laughs> 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 they don't come up there and, and uh, they thinned out a lot here lately. But, uh, but it's about, what, 7 o'clock, 7.30? You start hearing the guns go off. And it's always been like that. For 40 years, it's been like that. That's when you kill your turkeys. And uh, why is that? Well, it's because he's going he's gonna to get with the hens, and the hens are either going to drag him off or they're going to leave him. And the ones that get to shoot the turkeys they either going to have call the hens and the gobblers up there together, or they going the hen. The, he 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 goes to the hen in the bush, and that's when they get killed. So all that before is foreplay. I mean, it, in you know, it, it doesn't really, from my standpoint, it goes back to somebody that can't call good in the first place. Why do I want to call more? You know, that's. I've always noticed that the, the worse people are at calling, the more they want to call. <laughs> so, and it's not getting them anywhere. So, you know, tree call 
it it's best serves, I think, the contest. Yeah. And uh, then this is my opinion. Sure, well, that's what we're. I wanting. mean, I, I know that there's a thousand people that line up and just tell me how stupid I am, and and that doesn't mean they're not right. Honestly, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not. Uh, you know, I ain't got it all figured out. I promise you. Oh, uh, but I do it my way, and my way just, just kind of circumvents that part of it and goes to something that works a little bit better for me on average. You know, there was a time in turkey hunting where it was more than just a hunt. Now this wasn't for you know fun and games. That's how I fed my family, and I had this guy sitting here next to me. And he was paying me, and he brought three people, and I usually ended up taking the guy that had to kill the turkey, you know. And uh, if I hope they come back, it was, you know, they say, oh, I'm more interested in them boys I brought killing turkeys. That's a lie. You don't kill him a turkey. You got a problem. And uh, so it was important that I not make a whole lot of mistakes in 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 ruin any possibility. I didn't have a lot of turkeys anyway and, and mess up a chance to get this turkey kill for this guy. So that's why I have just found the course of least resistance. Just go with what works the best. It's a percentage thing. You know, not that I ever kept data on it, you know, it, but it you do. You, you know, that didn't work. <laughs> it hurts when it don't work. Hey, this is Mac. Checking game cameras is one of the many pleasures I get from gamekeeping. Onyx helps keep track of my camera locations to be sure I'm getting the information that I need to make the best decisions for the wildlife. Try it out for yourself and see. Use coupon code MOSSYOAK to save 20% on your Onyx subscriptions. Know where you stand. So in your vest, the ditty bag. Yeah, well, this is a this is a relatively new edition bag. Yeah, so that's one of those half masks with the aluminum frame for it goes around your eyes. Yeah, the 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 mesh is, but this stuff she sewed on and she took off those pants that they used to. Yeah, leafy flies. Yeah, and it looks that good. Way long yeah. time ago, and she sewed it on there. I she made that at my direction. So that's the same. I've had the same mask. I've got one of Lyle's little packets right there. You got to be careful because they will fall out of that sometimes. But uh, you know that that uh, it's a handy carrier. That's that thing that hangs around your hangs neck, around and, my neck and it's got and magnets you put it on it. In your pocket, yep. and I really very handy. Uh, I use it. I mean, I didn't always use it because didn't ever, you know till he gave me one. But uh, I like to try to run those. Uh, calls that are cut, uh, moon-shaped cut on one side, whatever they call I don't know what the names are, but uh, that's the ones that I prefer. Yeah, Matt, can you fact check that for us real quick? And, uh, I mean, it's Country Girl, I think. I bought one the other day over when I was here yesterday, and, you know, I think Country Girl, something like that. But, there, I mean, it's it's a call that that I can I can cut on a little bit. It's not as – I used to have my cut calls made custom. And a uh, boy out of New York made them, and he passed away. And since then, I hadn't made them. But he had, he it was he had it down to a science, the the tension and all that. And uh, and I could cut better than I ever could cut on anything. And, and most calls aren't made to cut on; they're made to do a lot of different things on. And so I don't have what I used to cut on, but I can get by. And uh, with with these calls, but what they do best for me is they yelp, and and I'm not a good yelper. I've never, I ain't never been happy with my yelping, but uh, my I I don't try to yelp a lot anyway. It's like what I told you earlier, what that little hen did over there when she was going to the gobbler. It's just a short mm, ow, 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 ow. might throw whine in there at the beginning of, mm, but in a three five note yelp. And shut up. Now, you want to make him gobble? I mean, you got to do something else, usually. Uh, so, 
you know, but go back to the what we're talking about here. We're not trying to make him gobble unless we don't know where he is. We're trying to kill him. And, and making him gobble and making him come are two different things. You, you make him gobble when you don't know where he is. You make him come by silence. Silence is what makes him come. He knows where you are. He heard you. If he answers you, you know, he'll tell you where he knows where you are or not. And depending on how far he is, he cuts you great. You know you got him in terms of him responding positively to your call. That's the best response you can get. If he does that, then it's sort of like calling the ducks that are cupped and coming in the decoys. Okay. He's, you know, he might not come, but he ain't going. I don't. So you wait. Zero data. You wait. Silence, silence, silence. If he gobbles again, he's in the same spot. Cut him with that little yell. In other words, I'm excited. Cut him. Be ready to cut him. Don't answer him because that suggests that you, ah, well, whatever. You want to come on? Come on. If you don't, whatever. That's not the message you want to send. You send the message with the, with the, the inflection and the intensity, but you send the same call because you ain't, great caller and you don't sound like a turkey and you don't go into this big springtime best call rendition because you might gobble three times at you but he's going like really <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know you you got him leaning back now <laughs> he's he's standing there leaning back dang she got a big mouth <laughs> i thought this I, you know who is that He's got, I don't know what's going on in the dang turkey's mind, but it, it's not what you want. What you want is him going like, okay, there she is. He thought you was gone because you didn't say nothing. Like you're not supposed to say nothing. Like the little hen that we were talking about don't say nothing. Now, he would have probably liked for you to be a little closer when you called. You can trick him a little bit maybe by calling a little louder. They they pretty slick. They you know, you know, don't count on that. But I tried it before. Sometimes it seems to work. Some whatever. But then you listen and you let him make the next move. It's a game. What if and now if he holds his ground and starts gobbling good and hard on you right there and turns and faces you and most of the gobbles are sent your way and and he's demand gobbling that you, come on, I'm right here. And that's a little issue going on there. And you're just going to have to shut up because if you call at that point, you're just going to make, you're going to reinforce him staying right there. Ideally, You've gone through that scenario where he's gobbled and you cut him, and he might have cut you back. He might go quiet. Either way, it could be very positive because instead of him gobbling that time, he might have changed color in his head. He might be feeling it. He might have broke into a little half strut, a little <laughs> short drum, you know. Oh, mm, you know, she likes me, you know? I mean, you got to, it's worm fishing. You got to imagine all this stuff. And the silence, you can see it. You, you, you get the vision. You know, you feel it. And uh, you wait. And you wait till he says something again. And uh, then you know where you're at with him. You're not going to call them all up. And, but if... It, you know it when you got one. I mean, you know, the time when he gobbles and he's three steps closer, you know, I mean, it's sometimes hard to pick up on it. It depends on the acoustics, but, you know, 
Is he going in the right direction? Heck yeah, it's sort of like him on the limb. Is he facing in your direction the full fly down? Mm-hmm. You're in trouble now, boy. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of so, – so he starts coming. You know, I've seen them when they start that process and they're coy. You know, they're real coy. And there's no obvious place for them to go. You're kind of in the bushes in the thicket, you know, kind of not sure like what you were talking about a while ago, Bobby, where to, where he's going to go, where he's going to come, you know. Everything's kind of homogeneous there. And they start that process. They come in moving toward that hen. They have a tendency to peck the ground. You might have seen them do that before. When they start, they take a few steps toward you and peck the ground. They look up, stand there in statue-like and just look. You know, well, what's going on there? Hen bitten, I think is what it's called. But have you ever seen a chicken in, in the yard with other chickens and a, and a rooster will peck the ground and shake and all the hens run over there to him like he's got something to eat? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had chickens, so I've, I've seen that. You've seen sure. that? Oh, yeah. Well, he ain't got nothing. It's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't have a, he picked up a stick and shook it. But the hens run over there thinking he's got something to eat. And yeah, they all you, run to him. You can just motion with your hand uh, as the chicken owner and do the same exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what the gobbler's trying to do. And take a few steps toward that hen and peck the ground. And when you see that, when I see it, it's like, mm, mm, mm. I feel sorry for him. Because he's coming. If you don't that, you, know, you don't run him off when you call him, you know? I, so, got, I got chills on my arms. That, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. We, we've, we've all been here at, at times, and there's so much, and I'm going to hush and let get, get back to you, Mr. George, because it's so fascinating to listen to you talk. But in this scenario, there's so much that can happen. A hen from, that you didn't know about can come sure. running in. Or another two-year-old bird can come running in there on top of you and run over you and... Yeah. You know what else can happen? You're going to have to lean back. That microphone is behind you. You, you, know, you. you know what else can happen, Bobby? A pink polka-dotted elephant can parachute out of a crop duster and land right between you. Silly sounding. Anything can happen. You're not going to call oh, them all. Oh, yeah, you, You're not going to call them all up, okay? Mm -mm. And coyotes, bobcats. Trees breaking in the forest, falling off on their own on a zero wind day. Uh, I have had it all happen. I've had, you know, hogs run through, cows come up there. I mean, if you can imagine it, it can happen. I had a crop duster, honest to goodness, buzz and start spraying the field. And I was just about to kill this turkey I've been knowing for years. I, just, I almost shot him. And, uh, but yeah, but that's what I call getting in the zone. When you're sitting there with that bird and, you, and you're feeling it and he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, it's not a calling contest, I promise you. Now, if it happens to be, most likely you're dealing with some young turkeys that are in a competitive situation. There's multiple, two or three gobblers out there, and they and they don't realize that there's a snake in them bushes, and 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 they're just, you know, they it's nature's way. I mean, they're excited, and and you crank them up, and that's when you can cut and yelp and and have fun with your calls, and and have you know, and make them do things they wouldn't normally do, uh, and that's all great. That's good for. That's a good release. You know, I enjoy the heck out of that. I like to show out, you know, I got a, I'm guiding somebody. And, man, he called him all the way across, and there was two others with him, and they all come running. And, yeah, mm-hmm. You know, you know, 18-pound, two-year-old, and, and, you know, great. You know what seems to happen to me a lot when that, that scenario you just described, it's not often you can see that bird do that scratch and peck or what, that you were talking about, but oftentimes it feels like, well, he got a little bit closer, and then he gobbled. And then the next time he'll gobble, he'll be 20 yards the other direction. Mm -hmm. 
And then we'll go back through that, and then he'll come back, and he'll come back up to that yeah. same spot. You, you got to be careful right there, because sometimes you can mistake that for just turning around, gobbling the other direction. But if you know he's he's yo-yoed back on you, that, so he's on a stage at that. He's point. He's on a stage, and that's in in whether you know it or not. And these stages are temporary more often than they're not. So he just decided this is where you know we're gonna do it today. We're gonna meet up right here. And, uh, you know, and that's it. And so you got to accept that. And it's sort of like what we were talking about earlier with these these old uh, Confederate generals, you know. we we got to find another place to play at because if you just keep pounding on him right there, you're going to shut him up and you're going to teach him what you sound like. Or, I mean, you might switch calls and all, but you can't switch everything. You know, we call like we practice, and we practice. It's hard to to really be variable in your calling. Everybody has a tendency. I mean, you hunted with Lanny, and, and he's hunted with you. Y'all know what each other sound like, you know? Uh, and why is that? Well, because that's the way he calls. And if that if you can hear it, the I guarantee you the turkey can hear it. And it's not that he's not doing something right or you're not doing something right. It's just that the turkey, you know, recognizes it. And even if you switch calls, you got that same stroke. You got that same rhythm in your head, and that's how it comes out. And and whether you're on a mouth call or whether you're on a slate or whatever. So uh there's a lot to that. There's a lot of we don't understand. We don't we, we're not turkeys, we just we don't understand, but I believe it's there, so I avoid that. I avoid them, and uh, I avoid training my turkeys because it makes it a lot harder. And uh, and I don't know. It just seems like it's it's you know it's better for for the turkeys and for for me is to you know be very judicious in how I approach them, you know, with the calls and all. But uh, I wasn't always like that now. Trust me. I mean, I've done everything wrong in turkey hunting you could ever think of, and probably more than once, you know. Uh, but that's how I learn. You know, you got to have turkeys to learn on. Yeah. And uh, and I was blessed with that early on. I had plenty of turkeys. And back in the day when we were out at Carpenter's Lodge and uh, didn't have anybody, you know, to guide, then I was going to kill the turkey. Uh, I mean, it was a matter of, of when, but I'd run the first group off the limb. You know, that's pretty, you know, regular. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, I would. I'd get in there and I'd charge off the hill and go down there and turkeys would fly everywhere. And then, you know, I'd get on a couple of others and something would go wrong. And then, you know, sometime on up in the morning, you know, I might get lucky and kill one. But, I mean, it, it, you had to have a bunch of turkeys. But there was honest to goodness. And there was, and out in that Green County area out there back toward Utah from Aliceville, there was a turkey goblin just about on every ridge out there back in the late 70s and all. Mm. And uh, four Reaganomics came along, and, and, and I love Ronald Reagan, uh, but uh, – you had that boom in the economy and timber prices went through the roof and all that old growth and and all that stuff became a, a, a product commodity and it, it got gone and we ended up with a bunch of pine plantations out there and I don't care what they say, the carrying capacity dropped on all that. So uh, And so the, there's just not as many turkeys out there as it used to be. But uh, it was pretty interesting back in those days and I, had, I, I was blessed to have a place to learn how to turkey hunt and I could learn fast. Yeah, and make mistakes. A and, bunch and, of yeah, yeah. Every one that can be made. So, Mac, uh, I know you've been paying attention to all this. You, you're taking notes over there. I, I want to make sure you get a chance to ask a question. Right. Uh, so, Mr. George, one thing I wanted to ask is you, you I've always kind of grown up, you know, here and, you know, you want to sound different or you want to be, you know, just that different hen or that hen that 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 gobbler hadn't heard before. Do you think there's any truth to that? Or if if you're set up on a turkey and you start hearing a hen, are you going to imitate that hen? Or are you going to do a different, like the same cadence and, and, and yelp when she yelps and cut when she cuts? Or how would you handle that turkey? 
Well, I do. I, I know for a fact in my heart of hearts, I know that turkeys, each turkey is a unique creature and has his own voice. And the gobblers recognize these hens. And uh, the subtleties there are probably beyond our ability to differentiate, but I do believe that. And I, when I hunt, uh, I, I go with what seems to be working at the time and uh, with my calls, where my calls are concerned. Now, there, there was, there's one case that stands out that I'll never forget that it was without a doubt uh, a thousand percent supports what you said about imitation of a particular hen. And it would, and I'll tell that story, and then I'll go back to where I was with this other stuff. But uh, uh, Ben Ezel, my mentor, he and I were invited out to uh, to Wyoming, uh, inside the the western part of South Dakota, and uh, the eastern part of Wyoming, around Newcastle, right in that area, uh, to guide some outdoor riders and the deal was that if we went out there and guided these folks and they killed a turkey then we could hunt go kill our turkeys so we flew into rapid city that's a long time ago now people looked at you kind of funny when you was in camo and stuff and all that you know and uh still do really but uh went out there and, and met up and that afternoon, we got in camp early enough that afternoon to go out and, and uh, scout. So I took my guy, and he had a lady outdoor rider, and he took her. And uh, they got in them, and we did too. We were on turkeys, and they were gobbling pretty good. You know, Mir these were real white-tailed Miriams now. They weren't hybrids or anything like that. And, uh, you know, you could – there was – elk pellets all over the ground mm. and you know yeah i mean it was just beautiful country i had never been out there before and uh anyway they roosted in the ponderosa pine and it was you know like golly i'm in heaven now you know that kind of stuff they gobbled good and and all but uh they ain't gobbling me <laughs> okay that'll hurt your feelings <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean i i threw all i was I was running back in those days. I was running a triple, a stack frame, uh, primo, you know, triple read, and I had a couple of doubles. I wasn't able to run them very much, and and uh, I still working on the slate and, and all this other stuff, but I, I couldn't run them. And so it, I was killing turkeys around here with that old, you know, barking dog that stack frame <laughs> triple read. You know, old Neil Call said. This thing feels like a biscuit in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously now. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, yeah, I guess so. It takes some getting used to, but uh, I ain't have any luck. I ain't make a turkey gobble the whole evening. Didn't make a hen yep, nothing. And, I, and my my guy was, you know, I I don't know if he knew enough about it to under, realize what was going on, but I, I went back to camp that night and, Got to eat some of the worst food I ever ate in my life. You ever eat mountain lion? <laughs> no. <laughs> it looks good, but it tastes like cat piss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, you think you remember, you know. And uh, so I'll take your word for I it. I don't look. It looks like country fried steak. It ain't. <laughs> Not out there. So got back in there, and I cornered Ezel, and I said, man. You know, what's going on here? What do you mean? Oh, call me Opie. I said, I, I went in and didn't, didn't, didn't work out too good for me. I couldn't make him gobble. He looked at me like, you dummy. Uh, he said, you didn't hear them little hens? And uh, I said, yeah. I said, they sounded a little funny, you know. And they did. They they beep. I mean, I can't make the sound, but it was like, it was strange sounding. It was a yelp to it, but it wasn't, it was high pitched and it just, I don't know. I just thought, you know, really didn't think about it. I should have been. 
And back in those days, and I, I think I brought some just to show you guys. But we were running. We were he Ezel was running, which he made me some. They were lead frame called. Remember people talking about that? Yeah, I remember them. All right. Well, these lead frame calls, there's an advantage to having these lead frame calls because you could spread that frame and put a little more tension on those reeds, and you could increase the the pitch on those calls. You could make them sound a little higher pitch. And, you know, he didn't let it, let me get away without rubbing it in a little bit. I said, dang, oh, come here. Let me see you call. And he grabbed that call of mine, you know, and I hadn't even tried it. And um, he pulled it apart and stretched that reed. And he said, now, see if that works a little bit better. And he ran it, you know, and had wheels swapping spit and all that. You know, but back in them days, I ain't here. You know, just put me on, keep me, keep me, you know, get me in, coach. <laughs> yeah. Keep me going, keep me on the turkeys. And But that's what it was. He went right out there, recognized that right off the get go, and adapted to that particular sound those hens were making. And I mean, it, it was on. And the next day, it, it he was right. Hmm. And so, yes, there is a lot to be said. I've had it happen on Easterns before. I, uh, when it gets down to Later in the season, and there's one turkey left gobbling out there, and, and there's, you know, and he's hanging out in a particular area, and and you know he's dealing with his hen. It's got the whole road dusted up, and you know you can see his strut marks and his tracks right here, and there's no all these other turkeys are either dead or they, you know, quiet or whatever. And this is a turkey. That, I mean, when he gobbles. And she yells, he's keying on her yelp. And that's probably your best bet if, if they're not really tight on each other for you to sound more like her, okay? But for me, I can't say that I can always discern the difference between the, you know, the parts of the yelp or whatever that, that really make her unique. I mean, some some turkeys sound completely different than others. Some sound like dogs barking. Some sound like you know got a, a yodel. Some have a big whine. You know, yes, they have significantly different voices, but normally it's it's hard to to tell. And the best bet is just to go with what you can do and stay within the parameters of a turkey and the rhythms and all that and, 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 and position yourself so that you have an advantage over your competition. Does that make any sense? It does. I've got one more for you, Mr. George. So like a lot of us, I mean, we're getting on turkeys in the – early i mean after they fly down not right off the roost and i mean most people that you talk to will say their success is is not right off the fly down so what are you doing in that lull period right off the roost are you sitting back and, and just kind of watching the play or, or or what what are you what are you trying to gather once that turkey flies down and assuming it flies down to some hens and you're just trying to stay back and, and, and kind of wait to see which direction they're going, how many times he gobbles, or what is your what is your slow play, I guess, on that? Well, you know, in a normal situation, particularly early in the season, you're going to have some groups, you're listening to multiple turkeys gobble maybe, hopefully, a group over here, a couple here, one there, that kind of deal. And most of them, some of them are going to fly down and hush. But the one that's left gobbling, that's usually where I end up if I got a choice and I'm not up one of these groups too close to pull out and without, you know, boogering them because if he's still gobbling, you know, there, there's an old saying that Ezel taught me a long time ago, and it says, son, go to the goblin turkey. 
that's simple enough. <laughs> okay, don't make it any more difficult than you have to. Go to the Goblin Turkey. And uh, and that's what I do. I, and if there's one left over here goblin and I, I need to kill the turkey, then the odds are he's not either satisfied with, uh, with the hen that he's got or the hens aren't paying attention to him or he's wanting more. But either way, uh, you got an advantage with him. You know where he is and what's going on, and you try to get in there as quickly as possible and, and engage and see if you can get him to respond to your calling. Uh, now, if you if you're on those turkeys that and and that fly down and hush, uh, and you're asking what I do then, and I don't have any options, I, I don't you know usually go cruising and looking for trouble until I'm sure about what these birds are doing. If for no other reason than recon purposes. In other words, I'll get on in there and I'll press the, the, the situation to the fly down area a little bit and see if I can pick them up in the binoculars or hear them drumming or, or, or make them gobble. I'll even try that, you know, before I leave, you know, just do a, a cut, you know, you know, and that kind of stuff and see if I can cut, make them gobble. So I can re-engage with him, you know, and do those two points. And, well, they they going that way and get around there in front and just keep engaging that way in a, in a careful way. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I certainly don't quit turkey hunting. I just go on audio. I just, I just uh, if I can't get that to happen, then... You look at the land and say, well, what would you do if you was a turkey? If you really get to a point where you don't know where they went, what they did, then you go on historical information or you, you you know, what are the hens doing early in the season? Well, they're feeding. Well, where's the feed? You know, you got to go back to the basics of what the hens are trying to accomplish through their morning Strolls are still are the hens still flocked up? Well, if the hens are still together, then they're feeding. They're not, you know. And so, if they're feeding, are they scratching in the leaf litter? Are they going out to the, you know, uh, the green fields? Or what are they doing? What are they, you know? And you got to realize it take they don't do anything in a hurry except, you know, evacuate. <laughs> you know, and so so they're just moseying that way. They're gonna probably stay in the you know in a mixed pine hardwood situation. They're gonna probably stay in the hardwood leaf litter, and and they might zig and zag, and they'll cut through the little pine thicket, you know, just without any leaf litter, and then they'll get into the next set of leaf litter, and they'll scratch around, and they keep going that way, and then they'll hit the gravel road and do a little gravel pecking, and you know I follow them all day long, son. I have I have stayed on turkeys from fly down to fly up before, and just stayed with them, just stayed with them, and without a gun and with a gun, and uh, I've watched them fly up, be there the next morning before they flew down, and uh, and that's how you learn how to hunt them. I mean, it's just you know they're just gonna be turkeys, and and uh, a lot of times they that. Just to give you a little insight, is that those hens are going to actively feed for a while, and they're going to make a little round, and they're going to end up somewhere they want to go. Now, that's vague and ridiculous sounding, but there are places, and I've often found it to be near water, and I don't know if it's the water that's attracting them or or something else, but... They'll in, they will what I call noon. They will go and do that preening we were talking about. They will go and and loaf and rest, and it's usually in the shadows and it's usually in a place. You know, turkeys disappear. Mm. Where'd they go? You know, you had that feeling they're gone. Uh, more often than not. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, where'd they go? It's a logical question. You know, you you. They didn't go anywhere. They, they went to where they wanted to go. And, and and a lot of times it's the same place. And out there in, in the flatwoods, the place hadn't just been ruined. They got these little drainages. And they're sometimes wetter than I, I would like, you know, for them. But they're, I don't know, you see moss growing on the sides of these little 
banks of these little drainages and, and sandy and open, a little bit more open. You got some buckeyes growing in there on that alluvial hump right there by those uh, those the, the little drains and stuff like that. It's a little bit more open and there's shadows and stuff like that. They, those hens will just go in there and squat and won't be dusting that time of year, but they'll preen and just hang out. And the gobblers sometimes will be with them, sometimes they won't. Sometimes the gobblers will split off, you know. Uh, but I have seen the gobblers go over there and squat and just, just squat down. Yeah. And all you see is the I've seen them do that before, and I've wondered what in the world is going on. Just take a break, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, you know, it, it's uh, it's part of their daily routine. Uh, I I learned when I was down in uh, in Campeche, uh, those turkeys down there, they did the same thing, but they did it in a tree. Hmm. Hmm. They fly back up midday. It's pretty dangerous down there. Right, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Had all them cats running around and 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 all that other stuff, you know. But I mean, they did the same thing. Dudley, you got a question? Yeah. Um, so I have a problem. Like last year, I missed twice. Uh, hadn't done it in two a long different time. Turkeys. Two different turkeys. Just had a bad season, overthinking or not thinking enough. I'm not real sure. I think I just get overexcited and pull the shot, you know, hurry the shot. But so the scenario I think is pretty common with a lot of people. Sure. Uh, or even we've if all, you're we've all done even that. if even if you're guiding, you know, you, you got a group coming into town and it's the last week of the season and it seems like the birds have turned off. But you uh, you you got to make something happen, or you really want to make something happen. Do you have a play for that that week when it seems like you can't you can't uh, get a gobbler to answer you, or you don't really know where they are, and and you're trying to fill that tag before the season closes? Do you do you have a little tip for that kind of scenario? <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody's been in that situation. Well, yeah, you know, uh, I was trying to think back, you know. Uh, yeah, a lot of the hens are already sitting on I the nest. I need a little bit more information. <laughs> right. so the, I mean, so you're talking about the end of the season. The end of the season, the hens are starting to sit on the nest the, a little the bit. Are, well, they ain't starting. They're either sitting or they ain't sitting. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, so... You know, I the mean, gobblers are, are go setting. Gobblers are gobbling. Most of the hens setting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gobblers the are gobbling less off, you know, on the roost in the morning. And it's sporadic last, in it's, their gobbling. It's last minute. It's the, the gobblers are sporadic off the roost right. in the morning. You might go two days without hearing a turkey. Right. I mean, okay. And the hens are prim primarily setting, except maybe the jennies and all that kind of stuff. You might see a few little... Real small little hen tracks here and there and all. Uh, what is going on there normally is that the gobblers are getting back together. Okay. And uh, if the hens are sitting, you're going to have a, you may or may not hear it. Depends on how good you, you are at killing them. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if, you, if you've got a bunch of turkey hunters in the club or on this place and and uh, y'all killed a bunch of those gobblers out there. So uh, that peak of gobbling that occurs uh, when the hens don't show up for the regular rendezvous, you know, for about a week or half a week or sometimes, you know, it's pro extended period of time or, or whatever. But there's a there there has been witnessed in my behalf. Uh, a goblin surge right there. But after that, uh, then the gobblers get back together. And when they get back together, they will still gobble, but they won't gobble near as much, and they go to feeding. And, and, and what I have noticed is that they relocate, and they start ranging. And if they gobble... There's a 
probability they you won't hear them because they're not anywhere hearable. They're out of your hearing. If you used to breaking day right here and hearing a turkey right there pretty regular through the season, and if you don't have a whole bunch of other places, uh, you know, and, and can expand your your listening area some, you might not. You just be might, might be out of luck because once those gobblers get back together, they start moving, and uh, they're not. They don't have a flocking instinct like the hens do. Uh, even then when they get back together, they, they, they might, they might not, uh, there's no real competition. It's the kind of situation when, uh, you can't hardly make them gobble. I mean, if you're looking at them in the field at that time of the year and you yelp at them, they'll raise their heads and look, at, look, 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 you look, and go back to pecking, you know, and it's like, so be you know I mean that's when you get green you go up there and slide in there and and raise up out of the bushes and kill him because you probably ain't gonna help him up. They're not you know? real, yeah they're not playing the game they're, anymore. They're not. They're, I mean now I'm not saying it's all you got. You have to go through a lot more turkeys at that time of the season to find one that that will work. In other words, you're gonna have to start covering some ground. Gotcha. And. Uh, and don't just go back to your old honey hole because, I mean, they've run out too. The hens are setting, and, uh, and and that's why you're not able to engage. You know, they're just not engageable, or they're not there. that make any sense? It does. It sounds like I need to, you know, quote. You need to try a new place. You, you know, Lack the, of a better term, you know, deer hunt them a little more than Well, than I mean, if hunt. they're still there, if you can find them, I would go, what are, What kind of feed are they seeking when they do that? Well, those, those biologic clover fields are pretty good pet. Yeah, more, uh, more bugs. Mean, uh, it's well, warmed yeah, up a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've killed turkeys late season, man. Their crawls be full. Clover and bugs and everything, you know. I mean, long beards now, you know. But I mean, that's you don't kill them the same way, right? It's it's a, it, things have changed. It's it's not, in my opinion, it's not as fun of a game. But well, you know, you're you're it's still harder. trying to you're still I'm trying on, to scratch the itch. Hey, it's harder, in my opinion. You go ahead. Yeah. Put three long beards together. It's been hunted all season long. So <laughs> yeah. how easy they are. Yeah, all that's true. <laughs> so we had one question that we wanted that, that, that came up in the group was that when you break day, are you, uh, do, do you owl hoot? Do you, cr- do you let nature wake up on its own or do I you do. try to force him to gobble? Well, that's another sometimes. I was, I actually, uh, Johnny Bishop, one of my Johnny Bishop, he got a voice, deep, <laughs> baritone voice guy, you know. He, he used to take me when nobody else would, when having no time for me. Uh, he did it because I had a whole bunch of turkeys, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I understand all that now better. But uh, uh, Johnny uh, and I, we broke day a good bit together, and and uh, he could owl. I've never heard anybody could owl like that. That sucker could owl. He could make your turkeys gobble, and y'all went two different directions. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And uh, I never had that ability to owl to that volume. Uh, but I could owl all right, not like Boyd White, you know, and 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 them boys, you know, he's one of the world champ- you know, Bob. You know, and yeah. all that. I mean, them boys can owl. But uh, I I could crow. And I I used to take folks crow hunting without that recorder and all that kind of stuff. And I crowed so much that I actually burnt my vocal cords. <laughs> no kidding. And I used to, toward the end of that crowing, I, I could crow and make a turkey. You know, crow's hard to imitate on a call, too. You sound like somebody blowing a crow call 90% mm, of sure the time. Yeah, you, know? you can always and tell. I, you can always tell. Mm. I've never I've never been fooled by one, I don't think. And uh, But I could crow better than, than you can crow on a, a mouth call. And I burnt my vocal cords. And toward the end of that, I used to take a, a, a pint of milk 
because my my throat would get sore and and drink milk so I could keep crowing. Sure. I'll be. That's the truth. But those are great tools to have uh, if you got them, and if you can, if you can make, you can use them. Uh, owls, they cut loose in the middle of the day on those mornings. You know, I mean, on up in the morning. I mean, you, you, you know, there's a time that more likely to hear owl, and it'll make a turkey gobble. Uh, it goes back to what I can do and what I can't do, and I I will not break my personal rule uh, of uh, if I can't do it and and blend in, I will not do anything to stand out. Oh, that's yeah. Say that again. That's re- that's really really good. Well, if I can do it and I know I can do it, same with the yelping and all that. If I can do it, uh, I'll do it. But if I can't, I won't do anything while turkey hunting to stand out, to be outstanding, to make myself obvious before daylight, after dark, and in between. Uh, that is antithesis of the whole game. And uh, so I avoid that. And I have gotten completely comfortable with uh, letting day break on its own. If that turkey wants to gobble, he's going to gobble. And plus... If, I mean, you're there because you know there's a turkey there. And you might not know it. You might not have been there in a while, but there was one. So you're in a pretty much the right spot. Uh, and what you're trying to do is find out where he is, but you're also, you also need to know what his mood is. In other words, is he, is he gobbling good? Does he need a hen? Is he going to... Gobble at one time on his own just full fly down because he's got a hen over here, you know. You want to know that. And if you if you interject yourself and start making him gobble, then you cloud the reed on the turkey. You, you, I like to know kind of what he, he would have done if I wasn't there. What did he do the day before I came? You know, what's he going to do this morning? So I use that information against him. And if he's gobbling at every jaybird and everything, every crow and everything like that, you know what I mean? I don't, I, why do I need to say anything? I just get set right, you know, or, or get set where I can engage when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, if I get that one gobble and kind of know things are, are you know, he, he's not he's not talking a lot. That tells me real quick, I don't need to be talking a lot either. I need to get in there and get tight and see if I can pick up the drumming, you know, or get in a spot where I can, if he does gobble on up in the morning, I can hear him. You know, that's where patience comes in. You can still hunt a turkey if he's not gobbling, because he's not going anywhere. He might hit that drain and go 300 yards down that drain. And if you know he didn't go back toward the clear cut, he's roosted on the side of, and he had to go generally that way, then go back and get on this hill over here. Don't walk down the drain you think he went down. Go over and get on this hill so when he gobbles at 8 o'clock, you can hear him. And just sit there and wait and enjoy the morning. If you're not hearing another turkey gobble, just you're hunting. Enjoy the morning. You know? Wise words. I mean, that's that's how you do it. You don't, you know, it's, I've, I've been guiding before, sitting there with, with the guy, and I made a turkey gobble because I, I needed to or and whatever, and he'd go, do that shit again. Do it again. <laughs> Make him gobble again. <laughs> oh, man. I said, just chill out. We'll, 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 I'll make him gobble when I need to, you know? That's. That's all fun, and I love to make them gobble too. But you know, you got to go back to what the what you're doing there, and it ain't got a whole lot to do with making them gobble. Yeah, Mr. George. So, so there's so much emphasis put on finding a turkey on the limb. It seems like you know going in, getting tight with them on the roost. But if I'm hearing this right, you'd rather sit back 
and then get on them after they fly down, get acclimated. You kind of know what the day is breaking like, how they're talking. You you want to have some homework and some ammo before you chase that turkey. Is that is that well, am I hearing that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying stay at the truck. You know, if the turkey's off there, you know, down off in that hollow over on that other ridge gobbling, you need to get on over there. I mean, that's where the action's at. But you don't need to get up his butt, you know, because you don't know unless you do know. You know, if you're going in there, pardon the pun, cold turkey, and you don't know what he's going to do, uh, then, you know, get on over there. And get where you can hear some of that more subtle stuff that might be going on, and 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 be prepositioned where you can make some of those checkmate moves that you might need to make. Uh, you know, I'm I'm certainly all for going toward the goblin turkey. You know, go back to the rule one. Go to the goblin turkey, boy, and and that's what I do. But I don't go in there, and, and unless the, I'm, as I approach that bird, and I'm looking at the lay of the land, and I'm going like, you know, I'll probably kill him right here, you know? And I might move on in there a little tighter. I can, I can approach without being seen. I mean, they got that advantage on you, you know? They up on a limb, and, and they can see, and they're expecting the hens to come to them, and all these basic rules that we all know, you know, we take that into consideration, and, uh, you know, if I just sit down right here, there's a good chance he might just come up, up this way. You got a 50-50 chance, you know, but you don't have to kill him when his feet hit the ground. And, and if you get that tight, then if he goes any direction but kind of straight at you, you behind him. And then you got to wait a long time for him to get out of sight and all his buddies and hens and stuff like that before you can get up and move. And then you might lose him. You see, so there's a time. The clock, the, the old clock is always ticking. You know, so you ain't got all the time in the world to get this done before things get really hard. And there is a lot of silence, and you don't really know what's going on. And you gonna and you'll end up spending a lot more time. People people don't do well with that part of this. You know, they don't enjoy sitting there listening to the red birds too much, you know, and and they're a little bit more you know, instant gratification type deal and and uh so but that's not how you hunt turkeys. You you hunt turkeys on their terms uh until, you know, uh you you trick them, you know. And, and it's about that. It's just about being in the right position and 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 just saying, uh, excuse me, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Yeah. George, it, it's fascinating to listen to him talk and oh, tell, yeah. tell this. I, there's one thing I want you to do. What's that? Yeah, I want you to I want you to tell your favorite turkey hunting story. Blue Lake, New York. Couldn't hunt in the afternoon. They had a big old van, and we'd all load up in that van. And those big, it was all dairy country, and those big rolling hills and hardwoods and the difference up there is the hardwoods is on top of the ridges and the pines and the conifers are on the lower slopes and all the the flatter land down in the bottoms is in fields for the dairies and all a lot of amish up there so hardwood rocky stuff up on top you couldn't farm you know and uh roads that wind around and cross bubbling creeks and all that just beautiful stuff and i was in heaven and there was a bunch of turkeys. I think they didn't open the season up in New York in that area until like early '74, late. You know, that's about when they opened the season after restoration and all. And it was loaded with turkeys, big mm. dumb turkeys. And uh, so, but there were some turkeys that had been hunted a lot, and most of the turkeys were on private land. And David, the Coles had permission, and that's where all the big dogs went. Well, Opie didn't get to go there very much. Mm. Opie got to go, you know, over there where everybody, the public land kind of deal, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I had to be careful. Uh, 
watch out for who, you know, a lot of them folks didn't know nothing about turkey hunting. And uh, John told me about this turkey that was he figured was an old turkey, and he lived up on top of uh, of that mountain over there in, in, by Blue Lake. And uh, so one afternoon, he dropped me off, and I walked up. This, and I'm talking about a mountain now, in my opinion. It was a mountain. And hardwoods, you know, when I got up about halfway out in pines, it broke out into the prettiest hardwood leaf layer over your ankles and all. And I'm walking up this logging road, and I get on up in there, and, and ain't nobody goes out in the afternoon up there, you know. I mean, you're going to run into turkey hunters. It's going to be a crack of day, you know, somewhere. And uh, I go up in there, and I didn't wear camouflage or anything like that. I just went up there with blue jeans on and stuff like that. But I got up there, and, and uh, it was dead quiet. Never forget it. And I I, I called a couple of times going on up in there and nothing, you know. And But I, I got up there to a point where I cut a bunch of scratching. And I'm talking about fresh scratching that, that had that acrid smell of, Fresh, you know, mold, mm-hmm. you know, leaves, and you know what I'm talking about, Dad. Yeah, that good and, dirt um, smell. Yeah, and it was like you almost like plowed drown. And I got up in there and I started smelling that, and I, I started seeing it, and it was kind of going upside this mountain, and I got in there on it and got off that trail and just followed this scratching all the way up on toward the top of the hill because them turkeys roost high now. They didn't ever roost low. They always roost around the break on that, those mountains. So I was getting on up in there, and dang if I didn't uh, cut the logging road again. It had come switch back and come around there, and I was standing in the logging road, and it went straight up like that and broke over. And uh, I was under the brake right there. And uh, something I learned to do, and, and Bobby's heard me do it before, I, I, I cut. Just like it was getting late in the afternoon now, and uh, I cut real loud. That turkey cut me, and I swear he about took my hat. And he wasn't, he was right over that break, and he gobbled, and I just fell flat on my face in them leaves. <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I could not believe it. And I had to go somewhere quick before he broke the top of that hill because I'm in blue jeans and all that. So I crawled over, and there's a log right there, and I crawled over, and I laid by that log. And that sap sucker come up on the break of that hill where he could see. If I had a gun, I'd have smoked him. And uh, he gobbled, and he gobbled, and he went quiet, and he drummed, and he gobbled. And it was like, I'm laying there looking at him. My neck was getting hurting, and I mean, it was it was getting dark. And here I'm up on top of this damn mountain, and it's getting dark. And he ain't flown up yet, and I ain't leaving. And it went on for a while, okay? And I, you know, and I wasn't sure I could get my way down off this mountain. I ain't having no light or nothing, you know? And, uh, and there's rocks and drop-offs and all kind of stuff. And... Uh, you know, I was a little worried about that, but I was more worried about that turkey. And and finally he hushed. And this is a turkey that don't gobble once or twice a year, according to John Reddy. He don't gobble. Well, it's just because they ain't been over there and eating. <laughs> you <know>? mm. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. you know. And uh, but he did look like a, a small Volkswagen up there on side. <laughs> you know, mm. he was a giant. They get big up there now. They twenty six pounds is not uncommon Dang. and all. And uh, but anyway, I heard him walking in the leaves, and he walked in the leaves. Fuh, 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 fuh. I saw him fly up. He's right there, and I'm looking at him. I'm thinking. Mm, mm, mm. So it was. You could still see him silhouetted, you know, against that sky, you know, and. It got later and got later and got later, and he wouldn't squat on the limb for nothing. And and finally, he squatted on the limb. You know, when they do their feet locked, you know, and he just sat there, you know. I wasn't going to screw this up now. <laughs> Not now. And uh, I had him pegged. And uh, so, I mean, I did. 
And I feel, I, you know, how you get that little feeling. Like, <laughs> and I, you know, I can't believe this, but it worked out. So anyway, so I picked my way down off the side of the hill. John was about to get worried about me, and I told him the story. And I, I didn't hardly sleep that night. And you know, he got me over early like I asked him to. And on the way down, I had tried to leave a sign or two, breaking a few you know, limbs and stuff close to that road. And, and I, I impressed myself the next morning because I was there with an hour extra in case I got lost. And, uh, but I got in there and I got right to where that log was in the dark. And I felt sorry for him. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got me a tree off to the side, and I was shooting Maggie at the time. That's my 10-gauge, three-and-a-half-inch Ithaca Mag 10. Oh, and, I bet that kick. And uh, it, oh, it, you don't ever feel it. And uh, I sat there, you know, and when it got light enough to see, poor Goblin time, he wasn't on that limb. And, uh, Go nowhere, you know. But you got to understand now. I did, I hadn't been turkey hunting fifty years now, you know. You know, but that didn't sit well with me. He wasn't, but he wasn't where he was, and that's okay. All right, so I dealt with it, and uh, turkey gobble way off somewhere on another mountain, and I heard turkey gobble. You know, no nothing gobbled on that hill, nothing that I could hear. So I'm sitting there, and it's goblin time. And I got to thinking, well, you know, John said he don't gobble a lot, so he ain't gone nowhere, and I didn't speak to him. He's right here. And I sat there. And then it got, like, ridiculous time. He's supposed to do gobble. He ain't gobble. And then that little... Thing inside you starts the what ifs. Yeah. And do I need to call? You know, what am I going to say? Well, he liked that cut. Well, it ain't really time to cut. So, what am I going to do? I don't know where he is. He probably flew off the hill there. Or maybe them coon hunters come through there. All this stuff running through my head, you know, and, uh, I just couldn't believe it. And I kept looking and looking and looking. You know, turkey's hard to see in a tree now, especially later foliage and stuff like that. It wasn't like wintertime when we were up there. And uh, so, I mean, it's daylight. No turkey. Nothing. And that undermined that feeling that insecurity, those terrible feelings that come over you that make you do stupid things. It was sitting right there on my shoulder, yelling in my ear to do something. And I fought him back multiple times. Kept staring at that limb. No gobble. Mm. Nothing, no fly down. Long, 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 damn long. Twice as long as it's supposed to be before he's supposed to fly down. Or he should have flown down. He ain't flown down. I ain't said a word. And I didn't really think about this like I should have. But that's just an experience. But there was a reason for that. But I didn't think about that. I was thinking about all what I was supposed to be doing and didn't do and should do. And I'm letting this thing slip through my hands and and this tension is building in this whole hunt, and I'm about to ruin it. But maybe I'm not. I'm about to ruin it by doing something. I'm about to ruin it by not doing something. I don't know. Yeah, we ask ourselves that question okay. a lot. So, I mean, this is turkey hunting, man. This is what we do it for. But it don't feel like it during the pain of the experience, okay? wonder You wonder why the hell you're doing it. But... 
I'm about to give up, honest to God. I come out, I come out of my head net. I pull my head net down. And I've learned a long time ago, if you don't want to call, don't put your calls in your mouth. Okay? So I'm gonna call. Because I know he just did one of them little sail down things and he swapped trees on me. He did this little sail down thing. And he's on the other side of the mountain over there somewhere. And uh that's where he is, you know, and I gotta make him gobble, and he liked that that cut. So I'm out of the head net and I'm going into my thing to get my calls. I used to keep them in this little plastic box. And, um, you know, licking on my call and all that. And I just happened to look up, and I, uh, I thought I saw something move. And, man, it was like, and it was a damn squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't your turkey. <laughs> it wasn't my turkey. And I was like, dang. And then I was really lost it, okay? I'm out of it. It's over. I give. Calf rope. And about that time, down off to that mountain, I hear a truck coming, gearing down and all that, you know? And, I mean, it's like, Somebody screaming or I mean it's just like so out of place in this whole journey that I mean I I'm I'm I just sit up <laughs> on the tree, you know, and I damn it's over. You know, I mean if he was around here anywhere, he's gone now. And uh and George, you're gonna have to lean back. And so I I'm just I I I wasn't turkey hunting anymore, bottom line. I quit turkey hunting. I was mad. And it turned out to be a garbage truck because I could kind of hear the talking a little bit, you know, but mostly the arms picking this big old garbage dumpster up. Hey, New York has a lot of people, okay? And you don't, it's not like around here, you know. They got garbage pickup in the country, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, and, uh, they pick this thing up, and I hear it grinding and crunching and all that. And about that time, they drop it, and it goes, boom, cow, uh, and son of a gun gobble. And he was right there where he's supposed to be the whole time. Huh. He's right there. My God. I about blew it. I'm unhead netted. I got Maggie, though. She's still laying like she's supposed to be laying. And... And I ain't said a word, I ain't called, I ain't done nothing. I just got my gun on my knee, and I saw that limb shaking. And he had just gone back toward the trunk of that tree on the same limb he flew up on. And he walked out there on that limb, and he flew down 15 yards in front of me. And he had some beautiful hooks. Oh, my goodness. So... That's a, that's one that I'll never forget as long as I live. That's and a great story. It was a journey. The dumpster gobbler. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> True story. Oh, my goodness. Well, Mr. George, we have enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> it is, it's just been a treasure for you to come up here and, and tell some of your stories. And uh, well, It's uh, our privilege. Yeah, we're going to have to make this an annual experience. Well, well you know, I don't... Uh, you never know how many annuals you got, but uh, you know I would uh, I'd come anytime you want me to come. We'll talk about anything you want to talk about, turkey related, and that's where I feel most comfortable talking. Uh, it's an honor for me to come over here and 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 interface with the people that are really front line in the industry that interact with all these young folks and old folks too that uh, y'all do a wonderful job and you all, you've been, you know, you're there for a lot of people and, and turkey hunting means, uh, it means so much to so many people and deer hunting too and all that. So, you know, it's an honor for me. Well, no, it's a, well, look, I, I appreciate you saying that. That's very kind, but this company is very humble. Uh, everybody here from Toxie on down, we, we, we just, we're just, 
it's uh, being around with somebody that respects the animals like you do and, and the hunt itself. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, it's our privilege to be around you. We appreciate you being on this podcast. And I've got you some goodies. Le- I got a levy sling for you to take back with you. We just, look, we just, it was just a lot of fun. And we, we do want to do this again. So thank you for coming. Been my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, yeah, thanks to having people like you here. There's going to be another generation of, of people that are going to be like you that's going to be able to teach the next generation. So it, it really does mean a lot. Uh, and we all have children. And uh, what my daddy asked me to do, I'm going to do it. And I know all of us that love our, our outdoor, ha- has our outdoor heritage and loves our sports like that, do the same thing and passing it on. And uh, that's why... I am more than willing to help any way I can because I think that's our responsibility. Oh, well Amen. said. Yeah, we really appreciate it. So, all right, let's wrap this one up. We'll do another one at some point here soon. So, uh, say goodbye, Dudley. Goodbye, Dudley. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.